Good timing, Della. Hey there, and thank you for joining us today. <coughs> I am, sorry about that, I am Della Rucker. I am known to some of you as the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop, and um, I'm here, but I'm here today in a different capacity, which is as the chief operating officer for a fantastic new startup that I am incredibly excited about that's called Trep House. And Trep House is a virtual super hub for what we call new majority founders who are, and that's people who are underrepresented, particularly black founders of all kinds of small businesses, tech and non-tech, and if there's even a divide between those anymore, and people who are, are really ready to be creating tomorrow's businesses, tomorrow's culture, and tomorrow's communities. The CEO of Trap House, uh, Kemal Ahakatera, is not able to be with us today. Uh, he had another um, issue come up. But I am so delighted today to be able to share with you a conversation with a couple of my just, just people that I so admire, so appreciate, and have learned so much from over well, the last on. few years. And I'm in the, I am very much in the role of a learner here. So I'll never live this experience, right? I support, I, I have put my time and my energy and my heart into supporting the mission of growing black and underrepresented founders because I believe that they are so incredibly crucial to our future, but I am still very much a learner. And actually, Camo is joining us right now. So I'm going to ask Camo to, uh, to give a little bit of a welcome and tell you all a little bit about Trap House. Camo, you are here. Hello, hello. I'm sorry I'm in the car. I'm leaving from, you know, a project to see my... Uh, one of our teams, you know, we're in a car. We're actually leaving from the site where we're going to be doing design to build um, operations out of. So forgive me for being mid entrepreneur, you know, mix. I'm on this call. So, Kamo, why don't you tell them? I, I started to tell a little bit about Trap House. Why don't you um, give everybody who's listening the very high level view of what Trap House is and how it works? Because yeah. I'd rather them hear that from you than from me, and then Absolutely. we can we can start our conversation with T and Ahamani. Yes, yes, sounds good. So Trep House is a virtual venture development platform designed to support founders of color from um, the challenges that they usually face in starting or scaling their ventures. Um, typically, you know, they're lacking resources, they're lacking exposure, they're lacking, you know, insertion and exposure into. Um, so, you know, we're looking at, you know, really making it to where founders can come to us and whatever the problem is that they have, you know, we can either solve it in-house or we have partners, relationships, you know, uh, ideas, different ways to approach that problem and help you solve it. I mean, we have this platform launched. We have the online community launched. I um, mean, coming into this second year of our virtual platform being live, we're looking at doing a, um, a, a, a fund that we're going to launch. And we're also going to be launching um, some part strategic partnerships with local stakeholders <laughs> in Dayton, as well as those, you know, in other ecosystems around the nation and even the world. Right, right. And Camo mentioned uh, a company called Design to Build. Um, Camo is actually the CEO of both Trap House, which is sort of an umbrella organization, and Design to Build, which is a, a, a company that's specifically focused on cargo architecture, cargo-based architecture. And yes. That's, that's a unique situation. It's one that, that Camo, with his vision and his capability and his ability to pull together, you know, operational teams behind him, has been able to make go. So, Camo, thanks for the update. And yeah, if you're interested, um, you can learn more about Trap House at 
T-R-E-P, like the middle of the word entrepreneur, trep.house, trep.house. So with that, uh, Camo, if you need to, uh, um, you know, go dark so that we can um, have this conversation and you can do the other important work that you're doing, totally get it. But if you want to hang on with us, uh, we'll be here. I'll be listening quietly and invisibly in the background. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. So Thank we were delighted when we talked about doing this event and we want that we wanted to make sure that we had a conversation during black business month, which has been the month of August. So we kind of just squished it in under, under the, uh, under the deadline. We wanted to make sure that we were bringing forward the voice of people who are living the experience of being Black entrepreneurs. And we wanted to make sure that everybody who was listening got to hear their voices and got to really hear and understand the perspective that they're coming from. So we have a couple of incredible entrepreneurs with us today. Timoteo Adiola Osanubi, who is known to all of us, and I probably butchered one of the pronunciations there. Uh, he's giving me the look. Uh, all right. <laughs> that, that might be a first. We call him T. And T fills, has two positions. One is that he is the chief marketing officer of Trap House. So he is kind of the owner of the marketing strategy that we are in the process of developing. T is also the founder of a new company, a newer company called STEM Whispers. And I'm going to let him tell you more about that in a minute. Nahamani Yisrael is someone that I have just admired and, like I said, learned so much from over the years. Nahamani is a digital marketing specialist she is within that area she has an incredible range of skills and has built a company that's employing several people to do digital strategy and digital marketing for folks all over the greater cincinnati region nahamani is also a certified trainer in a program called ice house that we may talk about a little bit as we go forward and I could not be happier to have these two folks here to be part of a conversation and for and for me to learn from, like I always do. So guys, T, Nahamani, uh, thanks again for being willing to do this. Um, so why don't we... here. Thank you for having us and for helping to elevate this platform. I think this is a conversation we need to have during Black Small Business Month and beyond. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, Namani, since you're unmuted, why don't you start by just telling a little bit about your company, about the kind of work that you do, and give us a little bit of an indication of how that has evolved over the more than a few years that you've been doing this thing. So my company is nahamani.org. We offer digital communication services. Um, we, mo we work primarily with entrepreneurs and nonprofit organizations, and we help them communicate their brand value using website design and development. We do social media marketing, and we also help them get media coverage for their events and for their big um, fundraisers and everything that they have going on. Um, I started Nahamani.org back in 2015. Um, and it has definitely grown and evolved. Um, when we first started, we were just doing website design and consulting in that digital marketing space. And we've gotten, we've grown. Um, right now I have three content creators that work with me um, and two website developers. So we are always putting out content on behalf of our clients. We're doing content for social media. 
We're doing content for vlogs and blogs and lots of great information. So really just helping them figure out how to tell those stories um, in a way that's going to really engage their target audience. Awesome. Awesome. So T, why don't you talk a little bit about STEM Whispers, what the purpose of STEM Whispers is, and give us a picture of how your company has evolved over the last couple of years. Sure. And just a quick point of clarification, the business name is delightfully understandable, but our program is STEM Whispers. And the program STEM Whispers is a marketing technology focused college and career readiness STEM program designed to end the school to prison pipeline. So there's actually a term for it for all my economics folks. It's called creative destruction, right? So something new eats something old. So what I'm just saying is this pipeline over here, bad deal for society. It's a lot better if we take the same population and put them in that pipeline over there. Fairly straightforward. Not a whole lot there strategically. Um, and it's been quite the journey, quite the ride. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let you steer it a bit more, but um, it, it, everybody loves it. Um, I have yet to come across one person that says that's a dumb idea. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and we are in the process of finalizing um, some contracts with my uh, some internal curriculum development and should be off to the races here soon. We've had a lot of good traction, um, won a few pitch competitions, um, did some incubators. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a very grow. It's been a process that has stretched me in a lot of ways, and I'm glad for it. Awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, let me um, ask you guys. Uh, to to sort of go back, I'm I'm thinking of like you know comic book characters and how they always have this like origin story of how they and and T is T is a, a a serious you know serious guy in that space. I so serious that I'm like scared to say Marvel versus anything else because I'm like I'm gonna screw it up. I'm gonna screw it up. Uh, but I'm so I'm thinking about kind of that that um that origin story so tell us a little bit about how you got into this what's your entrepreneurial origin story ladies first Ooh. Ooh, thank you <laughs> so um i became an entrepreneur out of necessity um i needed to be able to create income for myself and create opportunities um and i did not have the luxury of waiting for someone else to build that opportunity out for me. Um, so I became an entrepreneur um, because I needed to eat, I needed to feed my family, um, and I had these skills. Um, and yes, you know, there are, you know, places that hire people with one part of my skill set or another part of my skill set. Um, but there wasn't any place that was able to take on the full Nahamani. Um, so I created a place where I could be my full authentic self and bring all of the different caveats um, of what I like to do and what I'm good at together into one platform. Um, so it was definitely a, a need to, you know, create something for myself. Um, and it just was, it didn't already exist. Um, and I couldn't, I had, I had, I had, I have little ones. I have two, two young adults. Um, but when I first started my very first business, um, they were infants and toddlers and needed to be able to provide for them and make sure that they were going to be okay. Um, and this was this was how I, I saw that getting done. Nahamani tells an amazing story about taking her, your older one, right? When he yes. was a toddler, taking him to business meetings with her and having him in the corner, you know, coloring with crayons. And I just want, where did you get these children from and how, <laughs> how do we make those? Because <laughs> I don't think mine would have cut that so well. <laughs> but they, knew they, yeah. voice. They, they liked eating, they liked having clothes and shelter and they knew that that was the requirement <laughs> all right that's that's an interesting piece in and of itself and so t you you also came into this 
um, not just from, hey, let's go start a business. That sounds fun. But tell, so tell us about your origin story. And is it Marvel or the other one that, that you're into? No, it's Marvel. You got it right. Oh, okay. Game. DC okay. sucks. I said the other one is Marvel, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> if anybody wants to fight, like, feel free to at me in the comments. We can go at it. But, like, like DC's just too dark. Like, like a lot of their stories are just depressed. And it's like, real quick before I get into it, Batman's cool. But Batman has a terrible life. He has an absolutely awful life. So I, I don't understand why we exalt this person so much. He's antisocial. He likes to beat people. It's, it's like, it's it's weird when you actually sit down and examine Batman, how he has abashed this cachet. Um, and that's a perfect example of what good storytelling would do for you because in real life, Batman's kind of a jerk. Um, but moving on. <clears throat> So controversy, um, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. He's kind of a jerk. Um, so moving on, I mean, he has these things about you know snatching up kids and, and making them anyway. <laughs> Before we go completely off this went all sorts of places. Yeah, okay. yeah, like I'm like Batman's cool, but it's like don't don't like yeah, I'm not the one you want to have that conversation with. But um I was that bad kid turned good. Um, and it was one of those things I was the you know stereotypical pain in the teacher's class fought all the time suspended truancy mm -hmm. issues uh fast forward a, a number of years i was self-taught in digital marketing for a number of years because i took the longest gap year ever after high school um i took a gap decade i graduated high school in 2002 and went back for my bachelor's in 2012 uh sold it all except coke and um, decided to get serious about digital marketing because that's what it all went back to. So I went and got my bachelor's degree in digital marketing from Full Sail University. After that, I uh, did the rounds at some national and international conglomerates like Cox Media Group, Echo Brands, which owns most of the brands in the office and school supply space. So like Five Star, Trapper, Keeper, Mead, At a Glance, Daytimer, that sort of thing. And then when I was with Echo in Dayton, I got poached to Procter & Gamble um, in downtown Cincinnati. So I, I quote unquote made it, right? I was successful. And um, it's one of those things where I don't know if you've all heard that quote, the worst form of failure is succeeding at the wrong thing, right? That That's the worst form of failure. You you succeeded, you just did the wrong thing, <laughs> right? That That's a lonely place because when I was at ACO, um, I was the only black male in my division, not on the team, in the whole huh. division of the four teams that reported up through the VP to the CMO, me, Dolo. Now, in fairness to Echo, and not to paint him with a dirty brush, um, in terms of gender diversity, um, they did well. They actually leaned female, but most of those females were still white. <laughs> and then you had one other black lady who was high, high yellow. She was very fair, so she almost passed for white. And then you had my uh, Pakistani friend, Hassan. So um, there, there were other people of color, but you had one black woman, one black man, and a Pakistani gentleman. And that's it. <laughs> right. And so after the the, the short foray at PNG ended, um, I, I just took a look and decided that, OK, I can do the whole cubicle thing. Like I have the skills for it, but um, it doesn't speak to me. And I would much rather uh, take kids like me, the quote unquote bad kids, because somehow I managed to avoid the pitfalls of the system, but many of my contemporaries were not so fortunate. So take them and get them out of the school to prison pipeline and get them into MarTech because um, without staying on my uh, soapbox for too, too long, one of my issues with the way that STEM is currently disseminated in school is that it's still through an industrial age lens and it completely ignores the single largest sector of the digital economy which is marketing technology, ignores it completely. <laughs> so I'm saying, okay, get them out of this pipeline, put them into that pipeline, ta-da, creative destruction. So yeah, cool. that's it. Cool. So, so you weren't coming from a place of, if I understand correctly, you weren't coming from a place of necessity 
tea, you were coming from a place of um, kind of that, that personal, like you said, you'd made it, but you'd made it at what was the wrong thing for you. Now it was still necessity because I'm on child support, so I definitely had to pay the bills. But well, yeah, it was I, just like I had I stopped trying to, you know, do the 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 quote unquote. I stopped trying to make a quick buck, and I yeah. started following my purpose and something that is actually of value and a lot of value because uh and and the the you know the open secret in Silicon Valley. Uh, which I alluded to with Echo Brands is that their DEI is trash. It is absolutely horrible. And Would it's you really define ironic. that term, please? The DE diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI. Okay, just to make sure everybody's got it. Diversity, equity, inclusion is absolutely wretched um, at a lot of these large tech firms, and um, they it's it's ironic because they have all of these really lofty far left ideals of you know being community and making the world's information universal. But if, when you pop the hood and actually it, it break it down, it, it's the same old boys club. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, so definitely, no, definitely a necessity because I have three young ones. Uh, my uh -huh. oldest is turning 12 in a couple months. My daughter's eight. And my youngest is five. And I'm the type of father. And when, if you bare your teeth at my children, I end you. That's how I get down. And so I can't know what I know and have, you know, what I can pour into the community and not do it. Meanwhile, you know, Pookie, Ray, Ray, Daquan and Man Man dropping like flies, because I mean, the thing about young people is that they grow up, right? Like, like they, they're little now, but they'll be big one day, like Nahamani alluded to. And uh -huh. so, and, and, you know, 10, 15 years from now. I'm going to be looking for two daughter-in-laws and a son-in-law. And if everybody's locked up and dead, that don't look too good for me. Now, does it? <laughs> so, no. Um, yeah, definitely a necessity. So let's, let's look a little bit at what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And I, I, I know that both of you are perfectly willing to brag on yourselves a little bit, which as an aside is a good skill. A lot of us, particularly female types and particularly females who are coming from a more disadvantaged background. Wait, you're doing the drinking from the, uh, the, the gallon jug of water now too. That's a Kamo's the boss. <laughs> he, 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 he's the leader of the ship. And so Kamo's walking around with a jug of water and not now, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm down with the team. We will mention that Camo is one of the healthiest human beings I have encountered anywhere. And it probably has something to do with that jug of water with trace minerals in it that he's never without. So sorry for the, the detour, the but I'm, when I'm I saw that fancy. sucker come up, I was like, whoa. Okay. I, I'm not fancy. Like, like I, I don't do the alkaline. This is just water. This is just okay. like, cool. child support to do that to you. I just need some water from the tap. Just keep me hydrated but um understood we want hydration um so sorry nahamani i was i was going to you next um i've got my water but it it is, it is i know i know i haven't gotten to the jug yet i think i'm about 32 ounces here is that, <laughs> that going to that... fill it a few times yeah i know i got it i got it i think that's going to be the new the new like trap house signifier though is going to be the the, the gallon of water that we got lugged around <laughs> at any rate um it's a branding so, opportunity <laughs> there you go there you go no not money i know is always thinking um so but let's talk a little bit more about like that that backs that that backstory and 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 why you are able to do what you do. There's a, an old say, an old, um, it's been known for a long time that one of the predictors of, um, of entrepreneurship is a certain kind of, of grit, a certain kind, you know, the term we use a lot of times is grit. It's a certain kind of, there's like a personal characteristic, but it's really hard to define. And obviously it's not the same for every, every person. So, I'm going to ask Nahamani and then T, I want to ask you as well. 
what's made you a successful entrepreneur? Why have you been able to do this? Um, I like something that T said earlier about, you know, success for one is not enough um, and that we have to lay the stage for others um, and pave that way. Um, I was very fortunate. Uh, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. Um, so I saw it as an opportunity or possibility for me. Um, he was also probably one of my biggest critics, um, especially when I started my locks. <laughs> um, he was your biggest critic? Yeah, when I when I started my locks and he I mean, he started his business in the 60s and 70s um, and, you know, he was successful um, and he had very much um, gotten his success by, you know, conforming to some status quo. Um, so in the mid in the late 90s, when I first started my locks, um, he was apprehensive that it was going to saw my ability to grow in corporate America and that no one would hire me because they would assume that I was um, rebellious and um, that I would bring challenges to the workplace. Um, and he had some very stern conversations with me um, at a young age. And, you know, I was very much, you know, wanting to prove to him that I can, you know, I can wear my hair naturally. And, you know, in the 90s, locks were not quite as popular as they are today. Um, I can wear my hair naturally. I can maintain them and keep them clean and, and, and presentable and still, you know, work, you know, and, and get hired on. Um, so, you know, having someone who had made it, had been successful and, you know, had brought some of their beliefs into me and kind of tried to shape so part of it was, you know, I'm going to show you that I can do this in spite of what I'm being told I can't do. I love a challenge. Um, I'm the type of person, if you tell me I can't do something, I am going to put 110% into proving you wrong. Um, I don't believe, and that's the way that I raise my children, that there is nothing that they cannot do. Um, you just have to be willing to continue to try and do the hard work. Um, and as long as you're willing to keep trying and to persevere, to have that grit, um, you can overcome any obstacle. So um, that is something that is very much ingrained in me and my personality. Um, today we can celebrate it. And it's <laughs> it's a positive entrepreneurial uh, aspect. Um, but, you know, in, in my teenage years and in certain aspects of my life, they're like, you know, my grandfather used to tell me, you're going to change the world. Just not today. <laughs> so, you know, he's telling you, you're fighting and I, and I love that fighting you, but, you know, save it for something else. Um, so I, I am very much into, you know, I, I'm a fighter. I am, you know, a survivor. Um, I have overcome some really personal hardships and, you know, I, I can, I see myself being successful. And as long as I can keep that image in my head that success is an opportunity and a possibility for me, um, even if my current situation doesn't look promising and enlightening, um, then I can definitely fight through the temporary hardship um, and wanting to be able to kind of be that beacon of light for those that are coming behind me that, you know, they too can be successful. They can do what, they're, what they love and what they're passionate about and, you know, do it well and do it in a way that they can be proud and make a sustainable living for themselves. Okay, before I pull you in, let me, there's, there's a couple of things that Nahamani said that um, just, just kind of blow me away. So I knew about your, your grandfather, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and, you know, being a professional. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, I didn't grow up affluent. I knew almost no adults who were, you know, professionals who worked in offices other than teachers. So when you told me that about your grandfather a few months ago, it was like, wow. Um, but the fact that he was not encouraging you, because we a lot of times people will say that there's, there's a lot of evidence that the biggest predictor of becoming an entrepreneur is actually having a parent or a family member a close family member who's an entrepreneur. 
And so when you told me that the last time we talked about this, I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. But he was discouraging you at the same time. And so you not only had to, um, you know, kind of, kind of deal with, I'm a, sing I'm a mom, I got to take care of my people, you know, yada, yada. But you had this sort of, you know, pushback from from your and family I think it was a very big generational difference um you know he grew up in a time when you know conforming assimilating all of those things were survival tactics mm -hmm. um and fortunately because of the work that he and his comrades did um i did not have to do the same thing to survive um so i had a little bit more freedom to push the envelope in ways, um, you know, wear my hair like this. Um, I'm a big thing for wearing crazy, funky socks. Um, <laughs> when I work in corporate, socks. I mean, they can tell you, you got to wear business pants, you've got to do certain things, but, you know, there's no, there's usually no corporate rule about what kind of socks you can wear. Um, <laughs> so they would have dots and stripes and colors and just, you know, but so I, I do think that that is somewhat of a luxury that I was able to push the envelope and that I had those opportunities um, where he did not have those opportunities um, as a black entrepreneur in his era. So, you know, I think it was some of that, you know, warning me that, you know, hey, you know, don't don't ruffle any feathers and just go the smooth route and things will be better. And I'm like, but what fun is that, Papa? <laughs> And Papa's like, this is not about fun. Right, this is a survival. <laughs> yeah, wow, cool. And T, you know, you, you, your background is, is you know, I think a, a little bit different. And is, and in some respects, very similar. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm dope. That, that's why I was able to hold on. I mean, that's... that's the <laughs> um, but not unlike uh, Nahamani. I, um, the man in my life was my grandfather and he was his old Marine mm. and, um, he was a man of standards and woe betide you if those standards were not met. And our relationship was very, um, nuanced and complex it was just a, a polite way of saying we was beefing three quarters of the time. Um, now we had a solid quarter where everything was everything and we were vibing, but, um, most of the times we butted heads because while I would never have admitted this while he was alive, I'm a lot like him. Um, so I, I can relate to Nahamani's story from a sense of he, my grandfather, his version of kindness was making sure that you weren't weak. And to make sure you can take a punch, you know, in terms of debate and how you articulate yourself not actually hitting me but in terms of you know making sure you can take a punch the only way we can verify that is to punch you <laughs> right so yeah. um yeah he um i would say having having percy Oliver Rivera as my grandfather definitely um changed the trajectory of my life he was a professional he was not an entrepreneur but he still started a lot of things he was um the first black professor at sinclair community college in dayton ohio um he achieved the status of professor emeritus which is the highest honor an academic institution can bestow in 1997 he also founded the culinary arts and hotel management programs at sinclair um, he was he was on the board of everything like Premier Health and um, Concerned Christian Men, blah, blah, blah. And when he died back in 07, um, he got a declaration from the city of Dayton. And he also got the, a declaration from the state of Ohio. Hmm. And um, something that I'll never forget is that, you know, when my grandfather was alive, he would always brag about, oh, I know this person or I know that person because I'm on the board or whatever. And I know Clay Mathiel, um, for those who don't know, who, who the founder of I'm's Dog Food and a billionaire. Um, oh, I know this. I know that. And and I'm just looking at him at, as this old crotchety man that I could just never fully satisfy. I'm like, whatever, Paul, Paul, I guess go. <laughs> and then he dies mm. and all of those people show up. And it's like, 
<laughs> you really were heavy, huh? Okay. Um, so having having him be the man in my life, that is, I think, not think I know. That's a lot of where the service comes from. But also grit. Grit is not about grit and resiliency is not about painting a rosy picture so that you could just hum through the bad times. Grit is about being present and being and knowing that, you know, this might be happening today, but I'm still moving forward. And if I can get through today, there will be a tomorrow. Because if you look at prisoners of wars, POWs, those folks who actually made it through with their sanity intact weren't the ones who were telling themselves, oh, I'll be out by Christmas and, oh, this is going to be over soon and blah, 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 because then Christmas comes and goes and they're still there and then they have a meltdown. The, the folks who made it through were the ones that were like, you know what, this sucks but I'm still breathing. I'm still here. And in which respects to the entrepreneurship, I still have something to contribute. And so that's about, that's what grit is. It's not about this false sense of bravado because sometimes being part of being strong is admitting when you're weak. Right. And there have been plenty of times when your man, I, I had to call KMO. I was like, yo, we got to talk. This ain't working. Or, or I just got, you know what I mean? But being able yeah. to be there and be present and still move, that's resiliency. That's great. Now, that's crucial. That is absolutely crucial. And I want, I want to pull on something that, that you just referenced, T. And that is, and, and there's, there's a, um, a report that Camo actually introduced me to, and I've only got a black and white version. Hopefully you can see the, the name here. This is, if you're, you know, this is something that I would recommend literally everybody read. It's the Tapestry of Black Business Ownership in America put out by the Association for Economic Opportunity. And it has some, some kind of great information, both statistical and um, um, anecdotal, incredible stories that, that back up so much of what you guys have been saying. <clears throat> And one of the things that um, that really jumps out to me, T, from from what you were just saying, is that 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 sense of 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 just having to be determined, but also of having people that you can fall back on and get support from, and um, and commiserate with. And one of the things that has always been you know, really an eye opener for me. And Nahamani, I know you've encountered this with the um, Ice House program um, um, students. Is that I? Th I get the impression that for Black entrepreneurs, finding those people who basically have your back, that emotionally support you, that say, yeah, you can do this. You're going to make this work. You're going to get through. That's, that's a crucially important piece and maybe harder to find. What do you got? What am I off? Am I crazy? I don't think it's necessarily harder to find. I think it's up to us to create those relationships and to nourish mm -hmm. those relationships. Um, finding like-minded people, um, you know, if you spend your time in certain circles, in certain spaces, um, you're going to find similarities and you're going to find what I always talk about, um, find your tribe, you know, and there is a tribe of people that want to support you, that believe in you, and that are going to be there just to reassure you and reinforce what you already know. Um, and what I think happens a little too often is we get caught up in the wrong circles for the wrong reasons. Um, and we spend too much of our energy and our time trying to fit in somewhere else when that's not necessarily our tribe. That's not our space. That's not the people that we need to occupy ourselves with. And, you know, growing up, um, you know, in this, you know, there were people out in the streets and, you know, like, oh, I wanted to fit in with them. So I would speak in the vernacular and I would, you know, behave in ways that weren't becoming um, in order to fit in there. And 
I really had to mature um, and realize that, you know, there are people that are going to accept me um, just the way that I am and that they're going to love on me just the way that I am. And I do that. It's a reciprocal relationship. So I also accept them the way that they are and love on them the way that they are. And when you begin to nurture those relationships, um, like they say, anything you pay attention to grows. So when you pay attention to those relationships and you pour into those relationships, then you're able to draw on those when you need it the most. I agree to an extent. Um, I, I definitely agree that you have to find your tribe and invest that energy um, where it's reciprocated. That being said, um, most of the black community is in survival mode, right? We're, we're, we're like literally in survival mode. And so it's, you can't expect someone who is, or at least it's my position. You're, you're having, you're going to have a very difficult haul expecting someone literally trying to find their next meal or where, you know, trying to avoid sleeping under a bridge to have these big lofty five year 10 year like that's that that's not a reasonable expectation to have of someone at that stage so there's a and real quick i'm not a psychologist i don't play one on tv right <laughs> but i am a professional digital marketer and so i understand consumer psychology at a very deep level i understand persuasion particularly and i read a lot about it and i study up so there's this uh framework called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it just goes over, you know, you have your survival and your safety, you have this, you have that, you have self-actualization. Um, it's been my experience. And this is, to be fair, irrespective of black and white. If you find someone at level five, you can't have no level one conversation with them. That ain't going to work. You can't talk about self-actualization to somebody in survival mode. Right. And yeah. most of us, just because without taking you down the whole history lesson, um, most of us are going to be at the bottom. So from that perspective, yes, I, I have found it. Well, again, I'm not saying this to disagree. I agree. I only agree to an extent, though. I found it more difficult to find my tribe just because most of them ain't where I'm trying to be. And that that and that's not a character flaw. And that's not I don't hold it against them just because, again, I study and I understand and I know that there's there's a lot of systems upon systems upon systems that that have you where you are. Now, I'm not I don't make excuses because if you can't tell, I'm about getting it done. So I'm not saying you stay there. But my answer to Della's question would be absolutely just because most of us are at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and me personally, th one of my areas of growth that you specifically, Della, have helped me with is being able to accept having an ally and understand that, okay, just because she's different than me doesn't mean she's going to hurt me. And it's okay to open up to her. And it's okay to commiserate and do these things because oftentimes when you're talking about the higher levels of the pyramid, when you're talking about self-actualization, you can't talk about self-actualization with Daquan and Pookie. And it's not because they're not worthy. It's not because they don't have, they, they don't have potential. It's because they're at the bottom of the period pyramid and until you address the safety needs, until you address all these other things, then then you come into them with this like that's not going to work so mo it's been my experience that most of the people who are at that self-actualization who are at the higher rungs of maslow hierarchy of need don't look like me right. mm -hmm. and so i've like for example and, and I, I talked about this a little earlier before we go on the call so we live in this like faux enlightenment era where folks are all about, you know, let's let's get in touch and like do our, you know, make sure the chakras are good and no imposter shit, which is fine, which is I'm not making fun of. I'm just saying there there there's a levels to it. And a lot of times we just get the surface level. So anyway, I was in this um, I was in the office and I was uh, the only black person there. And they were talking about doing some meditation and, and close your eyes and deep breathing. It's like, I'm not closing my eyes around all these white folks. 
<laughs> like I, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing it because if something pop off or, or you know what I mean? And so. And this is in an office that you're not feeling yes. that level of comfort. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, I'm not about to sit here and close my eyes around all, you know, no, 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 no. So everybody there, hmm, hum, and I'm like, hmm, hum, like, like, I'm no, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 no. We won't be doing that. Which brings me back to, again, um, why I do STEM Whisperers, because for, 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 for tw- in 2021, for DE, for diversity, equity, and inclusion to be as dismal as it is, um, there's no excuse for it. So I'm all about building our own. I'm all about supporting our community, making sure that we have what we need to be whole so that it's not lonely at the top. Oh. Now, see, I'm the, I'm that one that was in the office doing tree pose and trying to get my coworkers to <laughs> to, to join in. No, I'm, I'm gonna do it with you with my eyes open though. I got I'm gonna be time. looking right at you like, mm-hmm, but... come on, let's. <laughs> <laughs> but I am that flower child. <laughs> but that also, sorry, it, it it strikes me that that also speaks to that, um, that diversity of experience is that. It, especially in a context like this, we 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 tend to want to simplify and say like, well, this is the common characteristic, or this is the the sort of prevailing issue. But even at that, you know, the, there's an incredible diversity of human experience, um, and it's not a one size fits all. And it, and we should never never conclude that it is a one size fits all which makes urban planners and economic development people like me really irritated sometimes. Like, just fit in our box. Just stay there. It'll be much easier that way. Um, so so we're coming up on, on an hour, so I don't want to – I could honestly talk with both of you, and I have talked with both of you for hours. You know, I would be completely happy to do that. Um, but – I, I do want to make sure that we hit on on one additional thing. Uh, so one of the things that Trap House is doing is helping entrepreneur-focused organizations. Um, sometimes we call them entrepreneurial ecosystems, or we'll talk about um, accelerators or incubators or things like that. And you both are coming to the question of, um, of those kinds of entrepreneurial support programs from a very different place. So T, as you mentioned before, you've you've gone through, a, I think, a couple of different accelerators. You've won some pitch competitions. Um, so, you know, he's he's got very much experience living in those. Now, Amani, um, as I mentioned before, actually teaches in a program called Ice House, which is not a... a a, a standard kind of accelerator type program, but it's really more focused on mindset. And I'll make sure that there's additional information with this video that 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 kind of explains that. But you know, especially at at this moment in time, there's a lot of I'll I'll come out and say it, there's a lot of white do gooders who like are saying, oh, well, we need to, you know, we need to support black entrepreneurs and we need to support black entrepreneurship and increase black and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I have made little hesitation in my life about saying, y'all aren't doing a very good job on it. And, and I just tend to say that kind of thing a lot. Um, but I think the, um, we we don't we don't always do that work and we i'm i'm vice chair of an organization um i don't know that we always do that work of supporting black led businesses the way it needs to be done in fact i'm pretty sure we don't um so i'm wondering if if both of you could just take a minute to talk about kind of your perceptions on what is um present and what is missing in the way we as communities support or foster or build up black entrepreneurship. 
I'll go ahead and kick this one off. Um, I would agree with that. A lot of times it's coming from a good place, but the execution sucks. Um, particularly in the ecosystem, a lot of times they just spout the lean startup um, and agile methodology and all that good stuff and MVPs, which is great. But w- the the main flaw in that logic is the assumption that you can have a first round from a f- friends and family round. Well, we're not from the socioeconomic uh, background where we can get 10, 50, $100,000 from friends and family. You do a friends and family, you might get 500 bucks. And if you want a couple thousand, we got to do a fish fry. We got to, we, we got to, we got to do some things at, at the church, the community center, just to come up with that. We, we, there is no rich uncle where I can say, yo, unk, slide me 20 racks. Oh, well, I was going to go on my third cruise this year, but I guess I don't have to. Here you go. Here's the money. Like, yeah, no. So if that's part of your methodology, that's the first mismatch. The second mismatch is, um, and I'll just come out and say it, there's a lot of predatory philanthropy out there. Um, and it, it, it is bad news and it's got to stop because one of, just because of the target population that I seek to serve, I've received pressure from the jump to be a nonprofit, which I'm not. I'm a for-profit education consulting company. Um, just because I'm focused on black and brown kids does not make me a charity. Um, and so anyway, you'll you'll get these folks. Oh, there's this fun over there. We'll, we'll even help you submit it. I just need you take 80. I will take 80. You take 20 and you do all the work. Huh. Excuse me? <laughs> So, um, yeah, I would say just at a high level, those are um, where it's been my experience. A lot of the would be help falls down. It, it takes the same framework and does not take into account um, our, our background. It doesn't take into account our experience. It doesn't take into account anything about our blackness. It's just they 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 parrot the lean startup. Okay, here's what you need, and it's like get ten thousand dollars from friends. If don't you think I would? If if I had the ability to do that, I'd have done it by now. I wouldn't be talking to you if if, if that were the case. And then the second one is uh, you have a lot of um, and, and, and that's not to poo poo the philanthropy space, but you do even like with with all of these quote unquote white do gooders, there are folks who think they can just throw money at this. Um, and, and everything is going to be fine. And they don't, they, they're not interested in partnering. They're interested in the photo op. They're interested in, Oh, look, they're, they're one of the, Oh, I have a black friend. I'm not racist. See, no, I even have two of them. See two. I'm ahead of the game. We're good. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that. (laughs) I agree with T like, you know, supporting entrepreneurship and black entrepreneurs, Um, we need allies that are doing it when it's not sexy, when it's not the buzzword, um, and understanding that there are going to be different challenges, um, and having the tenacity to work through those challenges. Um, you know, when things look a little rocky or, you know, maybe, you know, personal life is showing up in their professional life. Um, a lot of, a lot of times you see that allyship fade to black, um, and, you know, then the, the entrepreneurs left there trying to sort through all of the turmoil and keep the ship afloat. And we all know that that's not sustainable. Um, so that long term support when even when it doesn't even when it's not front page news and nobody's, um, you know, watching and, and making a big deal about it, making sure that that support is there, um, making sure that we do have access to dollars. Um, startup capital, growth capital, um, and taking away some of those barriers. Um, And, you know, I I definitely do think that, you know, the ecosystem that I've been a part of for over 20 years at GCMI, um, it wasn't just about, you know, credit worthiness. It wasn't just about, you know, um, can can you write a 40-page business plan? And if so, then we'll give you a few dollars. it was really taking and supporting the entrepreneur when you couldn't write a business plan, when you couldn't keep the creditors at bay, 
um, and saying, okay, you have something of value and we're going to back it and we're going to support it. You know, we're going to do it in a structured way so that, you know, we protect the organization and can help more people in the future. But, you know, taking down those barriers, there are barriers to getting capital. And, and like T said, you know, we don't have, we don't always have that insulation um, to be able to say, hey, mom, dad, uncle, can you fund my dream until I can make it profitable? Um, you know, which for me, like with my business, I had to figure out how to make enough to pay the bills, the business's bills, and then be able to take out what I needed to pay my family's bills. Um, so I didn't have, I couldn't, I couldn't wait for a break even point. <laughs> like <laughs> that, that was, that was not even an option for me. Like the, the, the rent was due, the bills were due. Um, yes, I'm going to pay the business expenses, but I've got to be able to cover those expenses. Um, and then I think a, another part of it is opening doors. Um, you know, I think that allyship really does need to be about, you know, putting people in rooms where they can be successful um, and putting them at tables. You know, I've, I've often been invited to tables and I look around and I might be the only black person there. Or I might be the only female entrepreneur there. And I'm like, how the heck did I get here? Um, but it's because someone invited me in. So when we have those opportunities and we have those relationships or that influence, using our influence to open doors for other people is is important, um, regardless of our skin color. You know, I, I still try to do that um, in my practice and in my work in the community. Um, and, you know, there are still people that are opening doors for me. Um, at this stage of my business, it, it it never stops, and the support and the need for support never stops. By the way, GCMI is the Greater Cincinnati Micro Enterprise Initiative, the organization that Nahamani mentioned. She is a graduate, and that Ice House program that I mentioned, she she does that work through uh, GCMI. So I'll post again some information about that below this, um, just so that people have. The Thank frame you. of reference. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. I've been taking notes the whole way. Okay, I gotta, you know, make sure there's a link to this. And make sure we explain that, and that's the job. That's the job. Um, so, so we're close to an hour. Um, you guys have been spectacular. I, you, your insights, um, in your just just articulateness in. And I don't mean, oh, my God, you could talk. But, I mean, just just eloquence, I think. I, I just, I, both of you just explain in, in ways that I'm so grateful for. And that, once again, you know, I learn from. Every time I talk to either of you guys, I learn more. Um, and I'm so grateful for what I consider the honor of, being able to learn from you guys. Um, so the last thing I wanted to ask, just to, to give you a chance to um, kind of put a lovely bow on this, is if you were talking to someone who comes from your community, um, so I'm placing it really local with, with the people that you know best, and because we're not all the same, and you were giving, you know, that person asked for your just general advice as they're starting out this this sort of entrepreneurial journey. Um, what would you tell them? I would tell someone, you know, if as you're looking to start, you know, do what you're passionate about, do what you would do. Um, without getting, you know what I mean? What is it What is it that wakes you up and that gets you up out of the bed before your alarm clock goes off? Focus on that and then figure out a way to monetize that and to build a structure around that, a community, both of people that need what you have to offer. So in Ice House, we talk a lot about problem solving. So what is that problem that society has that you can, that only you can fill? Um, and then also wh who are other people that are, doing similar things and build community. I have relationships with people that some would consider my competitor, um, but I cherish those relationships because they're, each of us brings something unique to the table. So it doesn't, I don't feel offended or threatened because they do something similar to me. 
because I feel that I, I can learn from them and, and that they have value. So, you know, find people that are, are trying to solve the same problems and utilize your resource as well. I would say something similar, but from a different lens. Um, first things first is heal your relationship with money. Because going into this, I had a very traumatic relationship with money, meaning all the things I did for money up to that point did not resonate with me. Um, some, a lot of it actually caused me trauma. So I had a difficult time following Nahamani's advice of what would you do anyway if you weren't being paid? Because up to that point, getting paid was traumatic. And so I... I struggled with that for a very long time because it's like, well, if I make this a business at some point, I'll have to get paid, which means I have to do something I don't want to do. And the, how I got over that was um, I would tell them to keep doing what they're doing right now, which is asking for help, because one of my personal triggers that I don't like um, and I'll do my best not to stay on my soapbox for too long, but I don't like it when people use our strength against us meaning they'll they'll gas us oh you're a strong black woman or you're a strong black man or you you can do it and you just gotta have grit and you just gotta blah 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 and be you know what i mean so you have this really warped sense of what strength is and you've been or, or you've conditioned yourself not to seek aid either you've yeah. conditioned yourself or you've been conditioned not to seek aid and that is fatal that is absolutely fatal. So do not let people use your strength against you. Seek help, seek guidance, and make sure that, um, again, a as you're, you know, getting to that center and whatnot, you actually, if you have trauma with money, that you address that. Because um, like I said, I've never sold coke, but I have sold everything but it. And it, it just, I hated the experience. So it just left a bad taste in my mouth. So it, and it, especially if you're being an entrepreneur, you got to sell, baby. You, you got to get out there and spit that good game. Champagne and campaigning. So if there's if if there's trauma around that, you got to address that. Wow. wow. That's damn good advice for anybody i mean i know i have we will we'll have to talk about this another time i have trauma around money that i know is still you know is sometimes a barrier for for me and you you wouldn't necessarily know that um just you know from from casual encounter but that's so profound and the ability to um to 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 build that community that that supports you and i love how nahamani talked about passion and then monetization and then community because i think a lot of times the community is for for all kinds of entrepreneurs um if you don't have some level of that community some level of of people that you can go to to ask for help, um, that's when you get in trouble. And that's when you, you, you know, if you're lucky, you crash out before you blow up. Um, but the, the fact that, you know, one of the things that's been a primary focus for Trap House has been um, building that community and helping people find their tribe even if they're in a place or a community where they don't, that doesn't, that doesn't just fall out of a tree and land on them. So I'm super glad that you guys, um, you guys are are having that experience. This is a great um, conversation. Now, yeah. am I saying it correctly? Is it Timothyo? It's just T. Just call me T. <laughs> just <laughs> go with T. That's, that's, why, that's why I go with T. But it's Timmy Tayo. So, so T, T, and then Nahamani. If people want to find out more about you, and again, we'll post links below. Um, how can they connect with you? 
Not Are Armani you, first. I got some back. What is there. this? Uh, we're passing the baton. <laughs> so I, I, I would definitely take the lead. Um, so if someone wants to connect with Nahamani.org, um, you can find me on across all of the, all of the social medias. I'm on Instagram and Twitter as Manage Cincy. Um, Nahamani.org is also on Facebook. I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, it, Twitter and LinkedIn are my, my favorite social medias. Um, and my website, I have a branding blog. So I'm always dropping information as I find it and trying to help people be better. Um, so go to my website, which is nahamani.org and check out the blog. And there's lots of good information there. So, and you know, schedule some time, let's, let's talk, let's do some business. And, and her blog is fantastic. T? I was just like, I ain't trying to talk to nobody. So just <laughs> don't, don't schedule no time. Right? But um, you can, you can uh, visit us at stemwhisperers.com. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Stem Whisperers. I'm not very active. I'm in the process of getting more active. They actually deleted my personal profile. So Twitter was on my, my crap list for a while, but I'm about to get back at it. Um, also very active on LinkedIn. And you can find me at T Adela. All right. So All I right. have to follow you and find you because this was fun hanging out with you today. So. Oh, yeah. You. Right back at you. <laughs> yeah. So so we'll have to figure out how to do how to do part two down the road. Um, like I said, this was like this is a dream for me because this is these are two of my like this was my dream team for doing to doing this conversation. Um, I just couldn't imagine two people that I would enjoy talking with more so so thanks a ton guys um if if folks are interested check out trep house at uh www.trep.house again the three w's the word trep t-r-e-p dot house like the thing that you live in um there's no dot coms or orgs or or anything on the end of it all right so trep.house and uh, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook and the other stuff as well. All right. So thanks a ton, everybody. Super appreciate it. And uh, you guys go have a good afternoon. All right. Yep. Go support some black owned businesses, y'all. What she said. <laughs> Do that. Do that. <laughs> Amen. All right. Take care, guys. Yeah. Bye.